All right, folks, welcome back at the Wealthy Theater uh, for the next part of Grand Rapids Public Library's Media Literacy Summit. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the Grand Rapids Public Library Foundation for helping sponsor this. Um, we're so grateful for all of our partners here today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's up in the um, front lobby. Uh, you can get more connected with lots of really cool resources at the Grand Rapids Public Library. We have all sorts of swag bags if you want to get um, more of a connection to our resources. In the library, we have um, um, folks who work there who can talk to you. We have uh, resources if you want to get more involved with ebooks, with audiobooks, with all the things that we provide that connect you to your community. Um, that's a really important part of what we're doing here today is, is connecting people more with, with their communities. Um, the next part of our program today is going to be our keynote. That is going to be from Sue Ellen Christian. She is a professor of communication at Western Michigan University. She's going to have a wonderful talk that picks up where our last discussion left off. Please, a big round of applause to welcome Sue Ellen Christian. Thank you. Thank you. It is so exciting to be here. That was a great panel. Thanks to the journalists who took the stage and help us to learn about the importance of local journalism, which we're going to talk, touch on today as well. Speaking of the swag bags, I brought some media literacy fortune cookies, limited edition. But first of all, they're delicious. And secondly, you'll get a little media literacy message in there. So um, make sure you pick up a swag bag. And this is compliments of the WMU Presidential Innovation Professorship, of which I am a named professor for three years. And um, I got that title because um, I started on a journey I used to work for the Chicago Tribune for 10 years and loved it. Um, I also worked at the LA Times and the Detroit News. Moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan to take a job at uh, Western Michigan University teaching journalism and wrote a book about overcoming bias and the importance of culture and context and truth telling. Everybody has a different truth depending on who they are and their background and their story. As uh, the panelists mentioned those very themes uh, on stage a minute ago. So I have a, uh, a background in journalism, and I came to media literacy um, as I began thinking about how people consume the news and how people understand information and who is our audience. I wrote this book called Everyday Media Literacy, An Analog Guide for Your Digital Life. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for the hard to buy for loved one. And second edition's coming out in October. <clears throat> As part of that journey, I was so excited about the message of media literacy and what it can teach us and how it can benefit us throughout our lives. And so after writing the book, I went to our lovely free public museum the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, and said, we've got to proselytize about this. We have to bring this to the masses. A lot of people don't read a, want to read a book. And luckily, they signed on to a massive two-floor exhibit that I invite you to go to. You'll see some pictures of it. It's called Wonder Media, Ask the Questions. Jazz hands. And uh, it is my effort to bring media literacy to all ages. Um, so let's get started about what we can learn today together. I keep forgetting I, I have this. Can we play the audio? For the first time, the American Psychological Association is issuing recommendations for teenagers' use of social media. And it comes at a time when teens and tweens are facing high rates of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. There's evidence that social media can make all of those problems worse. NPR Mental Health. Custom black t-shirt that reads, misinformation super spreader. Our definition is that someone who's basically pointing out the truth and it just happens to disagree with, disagrees with the mainstream narrative, we're, we're known as misinformation spreaders, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to control the narrative. 
Moments ago, Jersey became the first state to enact a law that will standardize media literacy lessons in order to teach students to discern fact from fiction. Uh, me, what is media literacy? A lot of people don't, we say it a lot, but a lot of people don't exactly know what that means or what it is or what bias is. How do we teach bias? So media literacy is in the news a lot because fake information is in the news a lot. And if I told you right now to grab your phones that there is a, a tweet going viral that a strange flying object grabbed one of those elite runners during the river run and swooped away with it. You have a BMI of 2%, so it couldn't have been that hard. And it's going viral. You'd all shake your heads and probably not even grab for your phones. But stranger things have gone viral, including the Pope wearing a white puffer coat. So um, we can't be careful enough in our era of uh, viral media. And so the reason that media literacy is in the news so much now is because we all have a computer in our pocket all the time, beeping at us and vibrating and sending notifications and distracting. So the number one thing that I am privileged to have right now is your attention. And it is the number one thing that you cannot get back once you have given it away. And it is in such short supply. So if you leave with nothing today, leave with the sense of your own value, that your attention matters. It is worth dollars and cents and success. When we give our attention to myths and disinformation, news that's not accurate, that's purposely not accurate, and that that news is, is that information is shared and spread, um, we have just wasted our important resource. So we are really used to seeing this sort of thing fly across our Instagram feed. And it's a pitch that NASA's rocket building facility is actually a film studio. And yes, it has been used as, in small ways uh, to film some places, but that is not its primary purpose. So I want to give a shout out to the fact checkers of the world. Uh, PolitiFact is a good one. and. They take viral, false social media posts and debunk them. And one of the things I highly value about fact checkers is that they tell us why it's not true. They give us the sources. So that key of how do we know, I would have answered the, um, the, the excellent question to journalists of um, what is one question to ask, um, I, I always want to know, how do you know? Think of it in your own lives. If, if, you, went to a, if you went to a party and, and somebody arrived with uh, one partner and left with another, and this is the rumor going around the college campus where I work at Western Michigan University, and maybe that's the talk of all the, all the students in my class on a, on a Tuesday morning. The first thing anybody wants to know is, how do you know? Who told you? Did you see it? You want evidence. This is a particular favorite of mine. So the well-meaning folks at the National Park Service uh, posted this benign picture of a banana in Mammoth Cave to show the proportions of Mammoth Cave. You think to yourself, how can that become Fake news. Well, it was given a new caption, so it was reframed. To the idea that um, what we really have here are children who are trapped in a deep underground military base or a dumb where human trackers, traffickers are holding them captive. 
And again, we can shake our heads. It's as absurd as my river run, flying creature snatching story. Um, and yet, it went viral, and viral enough that PolitiFact took the time to research it and debunk it. So I'd like you to just take a minute and turn to a neighbor. I think one of the really nice things about something like this is to uh, meet someone new. So if you are physically able to get up and walk around, I invite you to do so. And we're just going to take about 90 seconds just to orient yourself about your own media use and make this about you. Be selfish. Why do you use digital media each day? So this can be streaming, content, movies, TV, podcasts, radio, Spotify. It can be a magazine, uh, online, online news. Um, but let's stick with digital. And what are your expectations when you pick up your phone? What are your expectations of the media? And the last thing I'd invite you to just think about is what do you have in mind when you create media? So please, I invite you to take just 90 seconds and chat with a neighbor to orient yourself about how you're thinking about your own media use. OK. Sorry to interrupt what are obviously robust conversations. Anybody want to offer something that you shared with your neighbor about any one of these three topics? Yes, Ashley? Looking for connection, looking for updates or information, and looking, and looking to be entertained. Does that resonate with others? Yes. Thank you. There is a theory for everything. And the theory that, you're, that I'm asking you to think about is called uses and gratifications theory. Does that sound familiar to anybody? So this is the idea that when you go looking for media, you have a, a gratification in mind. You have a use in mind. I want to be entertained. It's been a long day. I'd just like to have a cathartic uh, experience, whether it's playing a video game or watching a really great sort of mindless action movie. Um, Ashley hops on uh, the internet for news and information. You're seeking something specific. I need to know the news of the day. I want to know. Uh, whatever happened to that poor runner who got whisked away by the creature in the river run. We have a use in mind, and when we are gratified, when that need is met, um, we've had a successful media experience. <clears throat> so one of the things I'd really like you to think about as we think about attention is to think about your level of expectation and to keep it high. So. I'm going to give you the gift of uh, telling you right now the five most important things I can tell you about media literacy. And um, to save us all time, and, and if you want to take a walk outside, I won't be offended. Here's the top five take-home messages. The first one is, you are the product. What I mean by that is you. Your attention is for sale. It is why social media is free. Because every time you click, you like, you share, you repost, that site makes money. Social media is free because your attention is for sale. Don't forget that. Secondly, center yourself. It's another way of saying be selfish. Be selfish about sharing your data. Be selfish about what social media you decide to join, how much of your privacy you share, who you're giving likes to, reposts to, who are you lifting up, whose voice are you lifting up. 
So it shouldn't be a mindless exercise. Again, one of the panelists in the excellent panel before this speech talked about the need for different voices and the need for lifting up lots of different stories. Pause to reflect. You might be interested to know that false information travels twice as fast as true information. So before you react and send uh, the viral video of the crazy flying creature with the runner in its beak, uh, just pause and think to yourself, is this true? If it matters to me enough to send it to someone else, it should matter enough that you're going to check it out before you share it with others. If it matters enough to share it with other people, it should matter enough that you're going to check it out before you share it with others. Also, to pause to reflect on the representation. What are you sharing that represents people in an authentic way? And what are you sharing that represents people in a stereotypical or a limiting way? So, again, knowing that what you boost um, is a reflection on, on you. And if we all took that attitude, it would certainly help to stem the tide of mis and disinformation that floods our feeds. Also, media literacy is not hating on the media. It is reveling in the many choices that we have. I well remember the days when we had three networks and you ordered your life around when Love Boat was going to be on Friday at 8, by the way. And so now we have, we can watch what we want, when we watch it, we can watch it in a variety of languages. We can connect with people through texting, through WhatsApp, from across the world. I can find out news in Ukraine through bloggers and podcasters. It's incredible. So the media is not the enemy. Um, this is not, media literacy is not about quitting the media, um, going cold turkey. Media literacy is about being mindful. And D&D &D does not mean Dungeons and Dragons, it means democracy and dialogue. Media literacy can help us to talk to one another because it invites us to think about someone else's perspective. One of my favorite tenets of media literacy is that different people understand the same message differently. Different people understand the same message differently. It's why when you walk out of a movie theater and go, God, I loved that movie, didn't you love it? And your friend says, I hated it. Saw the same message. Two different people have a completely different reaction. And that's a lighthearted example. We can all certainly think about issues on the national stage that are far less lighthearted. Oh, sorry, is that me? Uh, media literacy is the ability to access. You mentioned access uh, in your panel discussion. Access means that I have, in this case, access to, to high-speed, uh, reliable internet. And even in the United States, even in Michigan, that is still an issue. We have rural areas that are not connected. And think about how important your connectivity is to your success, to communicating, to your business, to your both personal and professional life. Analyzing is being critical about how we view the media, what kind of content we're consuming, and then we evaluate it. 
meaning we give it a grade. Is this worth my attention? Because we've centered ourselves. And we've said our attention is worthwhile. And I'm going to give it away to the things that I have evaluated as worthwhile. And don't forget that part of, am I clicking? It's my earrings. Oh, thanks. That's annoying. Sorry, gang. Um, my, uh, my media literacy definition, uh, as do most, includes creating media. And you create media large and small. You create media, let's just go small, texting, a little bit larger, posting on your Facebook, posting on Insta or your Snap. You might have a blog, and certainly as journalists in the audience, as freelancers, as storytellers, um, you have a much larger audience. So we are creating media. Again, we want to be mindful about what that looks like. One note, <clears throat> I mentioned that media literacy is not hating on the media. It's also not giving up media, although I do make all of my students go on a 24-hour media fast as soon as they start my global media literacy class. And the number one reaction of students who go without any kind of digital media, no music, no TV, only uh, accessing the internet for homework, got to tell all of their friends and loved ones, you can't even text. And their number one reaction is anxiety, incredible anxiety, and picking up this thing constantly and remembering, ah, i got to put it down. Some finally just put it in their sock drawer and forget about it as best they, as best they can for 24 hours. That's not what we're talking about. It's a great thing to do to go on a media fast it really helps you to clean out your media diet and think about what you really need and what you've just been uh, kind of junk food binging on. <clears throat> but media literacy is using media for our own purposes. I was invited here, and our hosts today um, include the Grand Rapids Public Library. So I wanted to give a shout out to librarians everywhere who I am working with to bring Wonder Media Ask the Questions, my museum exhibit, to public libraries throughout Michigan. Librarians, like educators, like journalists, are often confronted with people who are angry and upset about the information that they saw online. And because we have such a bifurcated society, we have different information streams, which we'll talk about in a moment when it comes to algorithms. <clears throat> but when you are dealing with the inevitable relative, loved one, at the next family event, who has a completely different worldview than you, who if you picked up their phone and looked at their news feed, would have a completely different list of sources of information than your sources. I would invite you to think about these steps when we're trying to do battle in our information flooded society. First of all, stick to evidence-based facts. How do you know? Show me how you know. Right around 2016, 2017, the word of the year from Webster Dictionary was post-truth. Post-truth, what does that mean? It means that facts don't matter anymore, belief matters. And if I assert something vehemently enough and, as, and, and often enough, that it becomes accessible in our minds. It's the accessibility bias. When you can think of it quickly, top of the mind, And the idea that if you believe it enough, it must be true, has taken precedence over evidence-based facts, 
through which we should be governing ourselves. A healthy democracy depends on informed citizens. And informed citizens depend on evidence-based news and information. The second thing is the hardest thing, which is stay unemotional when we're talking with someone who is telling us that absolutely the Pope showed up in a white puffer coat outside the Vatican a couple months ago. Try and stay unemotional, making fun of someone, ridiculing them, showing them contempt. None of those things have been proven to be effective in winning hearts and minds. I learned number three in my work in racial healing and in coming to terms with the ideas of privilege and oppression. And when you are in a situation in which someone is saying something that you find particularly troubling or upsetting because of who you are and what you believe and hold true, instead of reacting in a judgmental way and wanting to name call, turn instead to wonder. It's a great journalistic tool. I wonder why this person thinks this. I wonder why this person trusts the Epoch Times so much. I wonder. It really helps us to ask that question that tries to explore, where are you coming from? Tell me what you're scared of. Tell me why you believe this. At least it's the dialogue that we talked about in the D&D. &D. We're trying to keep the dialogue going. This is a shout out to <clears throat> the librarians. Lean into process and policy. Uh, a very common um, issue that librarians are dealing with right now uh, at schools and in public libraries are book bans and requests to remove books from the shelves. A single librarian confronting a constituent from their community is not responsible for populating the shelves of a public library. There's a process in reminding people that there's a process. There's also a process by which people can file a complaint and ask for a book to be reviewed. So again, leaning into policy and process, which so many organizations and systems have, can be very helpful when we're trying to diffuse a situation and get back to what's honest and authentic. And lastly, when confronted with someone who really believes misinformation, which, by the way, is so oftentimes lifted up by bots, by digital robots, they're not people. Counter with accurate information. Give them a source. You don't need to flood them, but here's a source about uh, what we might, uh, what we know empirically because of clinical trials about this vaccine or about this particular virus. I would be remiss if I didn't turn the camera on media literacy and say, is this worth our time? How do you know? Just because you're up here and you wrote a book and you did a museum exhibit, is media literacy worth your time and attention? And mostly, yes. But we're not there yet in terms of a rigorous science to measure the impact of media literacy education such as a forum like this. Overwhelmingly, the measures have been positive, but there's different definitions of media literacy. Some of them include digital literacy, some of them include news literacy, some do not. So there's a wide range of what media literacy looks like, and then how do you evaluate it? How do you evaluate knowledge acquisition, skills acquisition, and attitude change? Again, it's not a science, so we're still working at the uniformity of the measurements. <clears throat> but there's something undeniable in media literacy that has stayed true through the ages, and that is critical thinking and critical questioning, the Socratic method. Oops.
we need liter media literacy because of numbers like this. The average American checks their phone 90 times a day. It's once every 10 minutes. That's average. These are global figures. Hours and hours on our screens. Why are we on our screens? For a host of reasons, which we'll look at in just a minute, the white bar is the global average. The US is just a few bars to the left, a few more minutes, about seven hours a day, the average American, <clears throat> ages 16 to 64, spends on the internet. One way that media companies and technology companies, which are two different things, by the way, one way they keep us on the screen is algorithms. This delightful little creature behind me is Algo. Algo was created by WMU Surplus Computer Parts and you can visit him in person at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum. Built in my garage. Just like to give a call out to the Callaway eyeballs, which were the golf balls just rolling around the floor of our garage, and it worked. So, algo, short for algorithm, and algorithms are <clears throat> a formula designed to solve a problem. Well, what is the problem being solved? The problem is what media can serve you next, what the tech company can offer you to keep you online. If you're on YouTube, you're very familiar with the recommended for you function. As you're watching a video, as soon as one is done, the next one's queued up, it will play in five, four, three, two, one, and you're off and running again. Before you even knew that you had made a choice, so uses and gratifications, why am I watching this? Because it just handed it to me. It's like a waiter who just keeps bringing you great food. I'm not hungry anymore. I, I, I ate what I ordered. Thinking about that media diet. <clears throat> Algorithms determine so much of the content that we consume. It is why when we're having that conversation with someone who has such a different idea of what truth is, what's real, we have such different understandings of the world because we need to read widely to break the algorithm. If you typically read news and information that is conservative, the search engines and the algorithms will continue to give you more of the same. It will not diversify your content. It will not diversify your media diet. It will keep it going in the same direction and even more extreme. Similarly, if you read more leftist and liberal news and information. If you love watching action movies, Netflix and company is going to keep giving you recommendations for more of the same. That's what algorithms do. I mentioned a minute ago that tech companies are not media companies. Here's what I mean by that. Under US government regulation, media companies are overseen in a regulatory way by the Federal Communication Commission. So Walt Disney and other major media content producers are regulated by the FCC. But tech companies Google, Apple, Facebook, they are not seen as media producers. They are seen as the delivery mechanism through which the media arrives to our screens. And as such, they are not regulated in the same way. This is a really important point that has allowed, <clears throat> pardon me, has allowed tech companies to avoid 
some significant regulation that many people, including myself, think needs to happen to help control misinformation and disinformation in the cybersphere. About five or six major media companies, uh, five of which are housed in the United States, control roughly 90% of the world's media. Five major media companies, give or take one, control the vast majority of media that people see worldwide. So our Western view of the world is served up across the globe to a variety of cultures. What is the impact of that? Both good and bad. It connects us in important ways, but it also silences smaller, less well-funded, more disenfranchised voices that cannot compete with Disney, cannot compete with Marvel. There are impacts, again, to what we choose. And because, as I noted, we have this great great variety of choice. If you go looking for indigenous storytellers and their media, it's out there. Thank goodness for public media. Shout out to public media, another supporter of today's event. Because public media lifts up the lesser heard voices that are equally important, if not more important, to understanding different cultures and the way that different people work, function, believe, what motivates them. So who benefits from media literacy? You know I'm going to say everybody. But I'd like to give a shout out to the big D of democracy. Democracy benefits. Here's a list of some of the reasons why. Just to call out to that second to the last bullet point. Media literacy encourages us to think about who is this message benefiting? All messages are designed to gain profit or power. By the way, that power doesn't have to be negative, and the profit can be to a lovely organization, like we learned about a few minutes ago, a startup news organization trying to follow the money in our civic uh, life in Grand Rapids. That's important. So awareness of power structures is one of the many things that we benefit uh, when we use media literacy every day. You can't do a PowerPoint without a cute dog picture. When do we use media literacy? Your response, Ashley, was very typical to the mainstream. I go on the internet to find information. Large and small. Where's the wealthy theater in Grand Rapids? Or what's happening in Ukraine today in their counteroffensive? Staying in touch with friends and family is the second reason. And keeping up to date with news and events is the third. Which is why the title of this talk is Don't Be Fooled. Because those two out of three reasons are we are looking for information. We are looking to become better informed citizens so we can make good decisions. So how do we use media literacy? Well, in Finland, wouldn't you know it, <clears throat> they've been at this for some time. They win the Media Literacy European Prize for not being fooled. And one of the reasons is because they have integrated media literacy education into their system of education. It's a core curriculum. And it has paid off. It has paid off. We know through studies, for the fifth time in a row, 
Finlanders show us that they're not easily fooled by mis and disinformation. In America, we're starting to see media liter literacy education being codified into state statute or regulation in a variety of ways. The most ambitious is in Illinois. High schools are now required to teach at least a unit of media literacy. And that started this last school year. So we'll begin to learn even more about the benefits of media literacy and how we can apply it. If you would take out your phones and take a picture of this, you'll never regret it. It is such a great set of tools. All messages are constructed. When I write a news story, I'm thinking to myself, what is the first sentence that is going to get someone's attention? What's the second sentence that's going to keep their attention? What image, a graphic or photo, is going to draw people to my story instead of something else on the home page? What words in the headline can I construct so that my headline is attention getting? All media messages are constructed. And they're constructed with a language that uses its own rules. When someone breaks the rules, we notice. Black Panther, an all black cast, we noticed. Crazy Rich Asians, an all Asian cast, we noticed. Breaking the rules. The rules are also about industry-wide ways of doing things. So I just mentioned, as a journalist, the things that I think about. Journalists have their own rules. One of them is get the news out as quickly as you can. Another one is make sure it's accurate. Sometimes those two things are in deep competition with one another. Do you want to be first or do you want to be right? Ideally, you're both. The third thing I've mentioned before, different people experience the same message differently. Media have embedded values and points of view. What does that mean? It means that when you open any magazine, which is mass media, you are probably going to see a lot of beautiful people and their beautiful bodies on display selling all kinds of things that have nothing to do with their beauty or their body. Mopping the floor has never seemed so glamorous. We are brought up with ideas about beauty, about romance. A study of college students showed that a majority of college students think that romantic love happens in an instant. That you, there is one true and perfect person for you. I love my husband of 31 years, but I have to tell you, <laughs> it's not true that, but media gives us these storylines and these ways of thinking about the world and elevates values that aren't realistic. And the last thing, Profit and power. Let's take a look together. Please shout out your thoughts on this first question. Who created this message? A man. A man. What makes you say that? It's funny that you said that. What? Well, Talk to folks. She mentioned that it looks to her like it was designed in the frame of the male gaze. Uh, the male gaze, would you like to define? Uh, it's largely what most media is uh, framed around, given that it is a patriarchy. It, it makes sense that the majority of media messages are framed through male storytellers. Um, in this case, I would use madman as a great example in terms of advertising. Okay. 
Thank you. Sure. So the male gaze, looking at women as objects, as sexual objects, is a primary function of the male gaze. What creative techniques are used to attract my attention? What got your attention? What's the first thing? Just shout it out. What, what's your eye drawn to in this ad? The color. The color. Something else? The hat. the hat, the lines and the swoop. Her lips. Her perfectly lipstick lips. How might different people understand this message differently? People who are told and believe that skinny is preferable will see this advertisement positively. When, you, when she looks at it, this bottle, Sophia Vergara, Vergara, looks almost anorexic. We're getting to the values, lifestyles, and points of view, right? We don't have an unattractive, unhealthy looking, although we can certainly debate that, right? Uh, let's say unattractive or um, not healthy looking person. I might even be picking the wrong words there because we could all agree that this model might be too skinny and too perfect and but we're certainly having communicated to us a lifestyle. If you drink Diet Pepsi, you'll be this beautiful, this calm, cool, and collected, this colorful, <clears throat> and this skinny. What is omitted from this message? Entire worlds, right? All of us are omitted from this message. We don't look like that. I don't drink a I don't drink Diet Pepsi anyway, but if I did, I sure don't drink it like that. So just think about all that's omitted from the message. Everything from the background, so the setting, to who the model is, to how they're consuming the product. And then why is it being sent? So give me the obvious one. Why is it being sent? To sell Diet, to sell Diet Pepsi. What's another reason it's being sent, do we think? If you had to come up with a, a second reason. Promote an idea or a brand. Beautiful. So if you don't want to drink this particular kind of Diet Pepsi, there's a whole legion of products in our product line that you can choose from. Just to be fair. <laughs> so on your left is Calvin Klein, Reality, cologne ad. Faceless, particularly women, but in this case I wanted to include a faceless man. It's part of the female gaze, having a woman whose body is objectified and the face doesn't even matter. Her identity doesn't matter. We're just interested in the body and this is object objectification of a man's body. And then this is the real thing. When we think about our ideas about our identity, we can begin to appreciate how much media has influenced those ideas. The Surgeon General of the United States came out just this last week saying, we have a public health emergency, and it has to do with depression and loneliness, brought on in large part by social media by the perfect reproductions of fake people and ideas and concepts 
that particularly for young people who consume an extraordinary amount of media every day, day after day, it has an impact. We've already seen studies that show that the way that we read online is changing because of the way that we're getting the information. Let me put that a little bit more clearly. We do hyper-reading when we read on a screen. It's different than when we read a book. We read differently on the printed page that we can touch. That's just one example of the ways that digital technology is changing our brains and our circuitry. And there are continuing studies to look at how is technology and digital technology changing the way we're wired, particularly as young people who are digital natives. <clears throat> so I just invite you to think for yourself for a moment about an important part of your identity, race, ethnicity, sexual identity or orientation, where you're from in the world, your income status, your educational background. It could be a hobby that you have or a sport that you play that is really important to who you are a creative pursuit. Just think of one. Got it? Now try and think of a positive and a negative media representation of that idea. How does the media portray an important part of who you are? And how have you found the media that lifts you up. How have you found it? Did you have to go looking for it? Did you hear it from friends who are like you, who share an identity with you? As part of Wonder Media Ask the Questions, I used my journalistic background and went and interviewed individuals about what they think of the American flag. And what I found is that different people understand the same message, the American flag, differently. Another thing we did as part of the Wonder Media exhibit is talk to people in Michigan on camera about how an important aspect of their identity is represented by the media, both positively and negatively. I'd like to share with you one 90-second clip from a teenager who goes to high school in a rural community in the southern quarter of Michigan. <laughs> the party people! Party people! My friend, Peter. Of course. Anything for you, husband. That was amazing. She just listened to everything you said. Of course she listened. In Muslim culture, wives are much more obedient. No way, that's awesome. So wait, let me get this straight. Sweetheart, obedient wife, and I get to shout, Admiral Akbar, when I do stuff? You, sir, have got yourself a Muslim. I showed the girl, like, coming out and taking her hijab off and being more pretty without her hijab, just to like impress the guy. When that's not what happens, us girls choose to wear the hijab and we feel comfortable. We need more shows showing that strong women that wear the hijab and feel comfortable wearing it. And it's something part of our lives. It's our, like, it's part of our like character. We feel modest with it. We feel our protection. It's our safety. Towel head friend here should speak English or go back where she came from. I choose to wear the hijab does not oppress me, but liberates me from society's expectations of what a woman should look like. One thing that I really like is that showed that women are not oppressed. Women do not wear their job because they're oppressed or forced, and that we feel more safe in it, and it's just like, in a way, protecting us from the danger of society and all the harassment and all the things that's going on.
So we ask people who came to Whose Story Gets Told and watched the nine different videos, which included a 31-year-old man with autism, a college graduate and black man who talked about the fear of being stopped by the police, a black woman seeking her PhD who said how tired she is of the angry black woman stereotype, of a Native American woman who said movies like Pocahontas don't tell the story and don't tell it accurately. And every one of those people and others lifted up positive representations of who they are. So media can lift up as well. And as we saw from Abrar, people's identity as reflected in the media matters. We ask people to share their thoughts. How does the media represent you? And I just want to show you some of the amazing responses, just a smattering. If you were in control of the media, and if you were in control of the way that people got their stories told, what would you do differently? How would you tell a story differently? One person said, I'd lift up everyday life. Another person said, I would champion peace. I would champion positivity. And someone else wrote in their own language to speak their own authentic truth. I would be remiss if we left today without giving you the full definition of an important part of media literacy, which is news literacy. The idea of evidence-based, fact-based information. I don't like to use the F word as in fake news because honest news isn't fake. And if it's fake, it's not news. It's lies or distortions. It's propaganda, but it's not news. News organizations follow ethical standards and ways of operating that put accuracy first. A reverse image search, I'll show you a slide of in a minute. You can do it on your phone or on your laptop. It's a really quick way to try and determine if that viral image is actually legitimate. It tells you where it's been. Ideally, it tells you its origin story. And it's a great way to quickly figure out if something is authentic or not. Fact checkers use it all the time. Allsides.com is my suggestion to you to read widely. It gives you the left, right, and center on major national stories. Shout out to local journalists, though. Without local journalists, we don't know what's happening locally. Allsides covers national and international stories. But if we want to know what's happening in our communities, we have to support local journalism. MediaBiasFactCheck.com will let you know if a website is not credible. It's a real quick way if you've never heard of a news outlet or an information outlet, what is this? It's a quick way to, to check. They have about 1,000 different um, posts on there in terms of, of their rankings. Fact-checking websites, political, pardon me, PolitiFact, Snopes, factcheck.org, they're all great places to quickly check out something that you're unsure of in terms of its veracity. This is my own that I write about in my book. It helps me and helps my students when you're in a hurry. I don't have all this time to do a reverse image search and to go check mediabiasfactcheck.com. So count to three. Count the number of emotional words in a headline or in the headline of the post. The more emotional, the lower the credibility. 
Hyperbole is the stuff of clickbait. So the, you'll never believe. Guess what? Um, the most horrifying. All of those words meant to get our attention, those emotional words. And then count on your skepticism. And I'm hoping by counting to three, it will also mean that you just paused, which is one of the most important things we can do before sharing information or reacting to it. Check the author of a date and read beyond the headline. An astounding number of tweets that are shared are never read if they are sharing a news story. People read the headline, but they don't read the story. And oftentimes, the headline and the story don't match. The headline is clickbait, so it goes viral. The body of the story does not support the headline. And a wonderful phrase, read laterally. Go off the site to check out how credible it is. You don't ask somebody's mother if they're a good kid. You go ask their friends and the neighbors and the teachers. Don't go to the about page on the site you're trying to check out. Don't go to the mother of the page you're trying to check out. It won't be the most honest accounting. Go off the site and read, about, read what others say about it. That's reading laterally. It's the number one tool of fact checkers. Go off the site to check out the site. And wrapping up, I just want to show you what a reverse image search looks like. I'm happy to share this PowerPoint if you want to have these tools for yourself. This is how to check it on a phone. Those three little dots when you go to Google will open up a drop-down menu. You, click, you can click Request Desktop Site. Get yourself to Google Images, and you can drop the photo into Google Images. <clears throat> Same thing on your desktop. Drag and drop a photo that you're concerned about from a viral post. And it will let you know. Oops, sorry. Where it came from. I'm giving you this sample of bluebirds. It lets you know how many times a particular image has been shown. Disinformation is deliberately false information, and misinformation is information often unknowingly shared. It's wrong. I didn't know it was wrong, but I shared it because it was so shocking to me. That's misinformation, which is why we need local journalism to tell the story accurately of what's happening in our communities. So many communities are without local journalists. The number of local news outlets is decreasing yearly. And again, I'll say it again, informed citizens are essential to a healthy democracy, locally and nationally. And to conclude, I'm going to just show you this short 30-second reel of Wonder Media, hoping that you'll come and visit the Kalamazoo Valley Museum before it closes at the end of this year, and working very diligently to digitize it to bring it to libraries so that we can spread the word about media literacy and news literacy.
happy to take questions. And I'll show you my um, contact information. Please feel free to get in touch if you have follow-up questions. Is there any comments or questions you'd like to offer now? Yeah. I can repeat the question. How has media literacy shifted in the post-pandemic world? My first thought is everything has shifted in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Yes. Where it was harder to go off site because there was so much disinformation, misinformation uh, shared because we were interacting purely digitally. Yes. I think it elevated the need for news literacy um, exponentially because we were so reliant in our own bubbles. Algorithms create these filter bubbles where it really defines our world. And if I am pursuing only one kind of information, for example, about the pandemic or vaccines, I can really quickly get a distorted view of what's healthy and what's not, what's safe and what's not. So post-pandemic, I think that residue is still with many of us, um, particularly non-school age children who, who weren't living that uh, information warfare in quite the same way. And so, my hope is um, that it's elevated the need for literacies of all kinds, but my fear is that people are exhausted and it's easy to overcorrect and decide I'm either not going to access anything or I'm gonna access the same stuff because that's what I trust, it's what I'm comfortable with. Uh, neither are great solutions, but they're also default positions uh, that take less of our time and energy. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there have been many bills uh, or proposals at the national level to try and regulate in some way, confine, limit, um, oversee in a more um, thorough way how tech companies operate. None have been successful in America. You probably are familiar with about three years ago, you began seeing every time you went on a website that was operated um, outside of the United States, uh, a little question that said, do you accept cookies on this site? In fact, one of my favorite fortune cookie um, little fortunes that we wrote is, um, do you accept or deny this cookie? And uh, that request is part of the European Union's data privacy policy. So they were effective in at least taking a step towards regulating tech companies and the way they extract your data because you're paying, because you're on their site. We have not been so fortunate in the United States in making any kind of progress uh, for a nationwide regulation on the Facebooks of the world, now, now Meta, um, which also owns Instagram. One of the reasons for that is because Silicon Valley pays a lot more than being a staffer for a senator or, or a representative. The really, really bright minds in, in tech are not in Washington, D.C. suggesting policy. Another reason is because these companies, uh, in terms of the follow the money, they are incredibly uh, generous in, in lobbying and in supporting lawmakers. And so it's difficult to wrangle uh, the number of votes needed to actually 
pass something that's going to um, have any kind of teeth. So I'm a proponent of, of more regulation of tech companies because I think our digital privacy uh, requires it. It's exhausting to try and keep your data private. It's an exhausting experience. And the games keep changing. And you have to keep going and checking your privacy settings because they keep changing the game and the rules. And so I would like the onus to not be on us as the user because we're already being used in many ways. I would like the onus to be on the tech company. But so far, we haven't had success in that. There's a really great website called, let's see, Terms of Service colon didn't read. And it's a really great rundown of, hey, do you want the English version of what Facebook's privacy policy is? Here it is in a paragraph. So it did the work for us. It's a really great site if, if you ever are uh, interested in those kind of policies that are out there. I wish I could give you, you know, Senate Bill 452 is going to pass next week, but no such, no such good news. I'm happy to continue. Oh, sorry. Yes. Hey, uh, a question about a, um, an old maxim that I had heard long ago, back when someone was trying to weigh what is the answer to, say, a cable news program that we don't like. The, the old maxim was the answer to speech that we don't like is more free speech. And I thought about that a lot during your presentation when you were talking about how nowadays, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of speech. It's everywhere. It's all over online. And a lot of your presentation was framed around not necessarily how we speak, but how we listen. And the question for you was, you know, does that, that central idea that I think a lot of debate is based on, what is the answer to, to, to speech we don't like, more free speech, does that need an update, given what we know today about, about different communications, uh, about, you know, given what we saw in your presentation? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. I feel like, can you please organize another forum on that, on free speech? Because I don't have an easy answer. I honestly don't. Um, I always err on the side of speech in the First Amendment, um, which is why I champion media literacy and news literacy, because when we have it all out there, all the kinds of news and information, the burden is on us as the consumer, as the user, and as the audience to pick wisely. So really what I'm doing up here is, an, is the answer to your question, which is I, I would rather have the content out there and try and empower individuals um, to be critical and autonomous users of information. It's not, try, not trying to make a cop-out answer, but because I think it's really complicated. Um, and I do think that there are some important steps being made to limit, obviously, hate speech and other forms of destructive speech, particularly aimed at vulnerable people such as children. That being said, as you know from your journalism work, it's a slippery slope. <laughs> and there's always the exception or you know, the devil's in the details in some of these cases. I was trying to remember as you were speaking, one of the reasons um, for fair use so that we can use copyrighted material is f so that there would be more free and unfettered speech, meaning we want a, a robust civic dialogue with all sorts of opinions and that all of those opinions are protected speech if they're not hate speech. And I still think that's the way to go because I don't trust that tech companies, uh, so far they've, they've not given us a great track record in their ability to pick and choose um, what information we need and what information should be lifted or not because it's all about the money, always. And as noted previously, you can pay to have your posts 
lift it as sponsored content. There's all sorts of things you can do to gain the system. So I, I'm not um, going to put my hope in tech companies to regulate speech. I'm going to put my hope in democracy that citizens are going to feel empowered and not overwhelmed. I'm happy to stay after and talk with anyone. Thank you so much. It, I really enjoyed getting to talk with you all. Thank you. Cookie time.